Amen. All right, of course, it's very, uh, I'm very happy to be here at the Red Hot Preaching Conference. I just want to thank Pastor Jimenez for inviting me out and thank everyone here at Verity Baptist Church. Uh, you're putting on a really great conference here, and I mean that. I know it's a lot of work. Pastor Jimenez already was, was expressing uh, how good of a job he did, but it really is. Um, I know it's tons of work, and there's many people in the background doing a lot of work, and uh, I just want to say you're doing an awesome job. I've been here since Friday, and, and everything has just been great. So thank you all so much for, for having me here. And of course, we're closing out the conference tonight, and we started off here in Jeremiah chapter number 7, and what we see in this passage is uh, the consequences of a backsliding nation, right? The children of Israel who have just completely strayed away from the Lord. And one of the reasons we're starting with this, and I want to encourage you, I want to show you some ways to, to not backslide and, and to not um, end up just not hearing what God uh, has for us. And, and you've already heard a lot of great sermons this week, a lot of great preachers and, um, and, and really good challenges and encouragements to, uh, to change your life and, and to, to serve God more fully and more perfectly from, from people who've been studying the Word and um, our, our, our pastors and, and people who God has ordained to deliver His Word and deliver His message. And you know, um, we, we ought not to ignore those things. And I want you to just, we're going to look down real quick in Jeremiah chapter 7, and um, I want to apply some of this to what we've heard already this week. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. And this is a real common uh, uh, theme throughout the Scripture where God is, is expressing multiple times, Look, I want your obedience. I don't need all your sacrifices. I don't need you to necessarily do anything for me. I just want you to obey my voice. I want you to listen to my words. I want you to put my words into practice and just do what I'm commanding you to do. This is what God has always just wanted for his people, yet the people are always coming up with their own ideas and, no, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to serve God this way. And then they end up making you know, going outside of his word and, and creating these altars and saying they're worshiping the Lord, but they're making these idols and doing all these other things when God's just going like, look, I told you what I want you to do. Just obey me, right? But it's, it's not just a face palm because obviously there, there's serious consequences for the children of Israel, for God's people just to be, to be kind of turning their back on the, on the things of God and just rejecting what they've been taught and rejecting what they're hearing and just deciding to go and do things their own way. Look at verse number 24. The Bible says, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear. Basically, they just didn't listen. They didn't want to listen. They weren't, they weren't inclining their ear. And I would just encourage you, you know, based on the sermons we heard already this week, you know, that you don't just not listen or, or not incline your ear to the great truths that have already come across this pulpit, but, but remember them. You know, don't be the forgetful hearer that's going to leave and be like, man, that conference was great, everything was awesome, but then everything in your life is exactly the same as it was before you came here. The Bible says, but walked in the counsels and imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Our Christian life ought to be marked by forward progress. We want to be very vigilant to make sure we don't end up sliding backward, and the way we're going to do that is by not listening to what God would have for us to do. It's, 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 it's amazing how, on the one hand, the Word of God and what God has for us is actually really simple, right, in the sense that it's, it's not complicated. There's, there's multiple things that the Bible is exhorting us and commanding us to do. It's not complicated, but it's just a matter of putting it into practice, overcoming our flesh, right? That's the hard part, is actually doing it, but what we're supposed to do is not complicated. And the longer you're going to church, the longer you've been a Christian, the more you've been reading your Bible, you realize that you kind of see the same things over and over and over again, yet people still continue to struggle with these things. And we had a great podcast earlier uh, with Pastor Shelley, and, and it's, it's real interesting because we didn't talk about what I was going to be preaching today, but it, but it really is, uh, it really lined up perfectly with, uh, with the content of my sermon tonight and the importance of coming to church and, and trying to make sure you don't get distracted with the cares of this world and end up just not serving God 
because of whatever is going on, whether that be politics or, or sports or just anything else that could kind of draw you away from serving the Lord. Now, everyone here today, obviously you're here because you care about the things of God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here sweating and fanning yourselves and, go, and dealing with the red hot preaching conference and, and hearing preachers rip your face and, and hold up big scary masks and <laughs> doing those things. No, I have no props today, so I'm not, I'm not much of a prop preacher. So you won't have any of that from me. But, um, you know, you wouldn't be here if, if you didn't care about the things of God. So, but what I want to encourage you to and, and also warn you against is straying away in the future, right? I want you to leave here today with some good advice and some good practical uh, applications of the word of God to ensure that you will continue to move forward, that you're going to take what you've received and put it into practice, that you don't end up by the wayside or even worse, end up kind of rejecting the things that God would have you to do and end up just becoming disobedient and then falling into a position where you may end up being having to be chastised by the Lord and being punished because of your disobedience. Uh, turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. And as with most things, you know, it, it boils down to, to, your, to where your heart is. You know, your heart needs to be right. If you want to serve God, your heart needs to be in it. Your heart needs to be right. You need to maintain that, uh, that as a forefront uh, for doing the things that we do, for, for even going out and preaching the gospel, going, coming to church and doing these things. Your heart needs to be right with the Lord. And I, and I warn you against an attitude that I think sometimes people end up getting, especially if you've been uh, growing quite a bit, you've been in the faith for a long time, maybe you've been coming to a good church for a long time, you've changed your life tremendously, okay? And if you, if you haven't gotten to, to that point yet of having lots of changes, getting a lot of sin out of your life, look, keep going down that path. But there's, there's a, a danger in having this mentality or this mindset of thinking that, like, you've arrived in your spiritual life. I go, so when I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible, right? Like, you do these things. And look, amen, do those things, right? But, but don't allow yourself to get to the point to where you just kind of think, like, I am just doing everything that I need to do, and everything's great. I've checked every box, and sort of I'm going to be just coasting now doing these things, that is a dangerous place to be because I'll tell you what, if you're not moving forward, you're going to find yourself moving back. Yeah. And we need to, and, and that's just the truth of the matter. There is no stagnation for any significant period of time in the Christian life. It's one of those things that you must keep yourself pressing yep. forward and moving on and trying to continue to grow and advance because as soon as you stop, as soon as you think like, well, I'm just going to kind of take a break from the things of God, or I've got this all down, I'm just going to go on autopilot, is, is exactly the moment when you start to, to slide back. Yeah. And oftentimes you won't even realize it until you're much further down that path of backsliding. Look at uh, verse number 8 in Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead." Look at verse number 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And, and, you know, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm not going to spend too much time on this passage, but essentially what the Apostle Paul is teaching here, what he's trying to say, is when he says, I count not myself to have apprehended. That's the mindset that he has. Now, on the one hand, we know, of course, salvation, your eternal life 
It is completely by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage we read in context clearly expresses that truth. And we know that there's a resurrection to come. And we know that, that once you put your trust in Christ, that is an automatic thing. That is a sure thing. We have the hope of that resurrection. You will be a part of that resurrection. In, in that regard, you've already attained to that, re that resurrection. But there's a better resurrection for people who are keeping the ways of God and doing the right things and obeying the Lord and doing the work that you're going to receive a lot of extra rewards. And Apostle Paul is saying here, look, I don't count myself to have apprehended anything. I'm just going to keep on working and, and, and working until the day I breathe my last breath and, and make that be my mindset. And whatever I've done in the past, I'm just not going to, I'm just going to forget about that because it's done. I mean, wh whether it be great things for God or no things for God, it's done. But I'm going to keep pressing forward for that mark. I'm not just going to coast now the rest of my life. I'm going to stay with it and, and make sure that I keep moving towards that mark. And look, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if anyone actually thinks you've arrived in your Christian life, you better think again. Right? There's, there's so much more. God's standard of holiness and perfection is, is essentially unattainable while we're in this flesh, which is why we need to continue to strive and keep pressing towards that mark every day of our existence here on this life. The Bible says in verse 15 there, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Let's not lose ground. Hey, wherever you've already attained to, let's keep building upon that and keep moving forward and not allow yourself to fall back. We need to keep increasing more and more. You don't have to turn there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 9, the Bible reads, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. And, and this is a good report. The Apostle Paul's teaching here to the Thessalonians, he's saying, look, I know you have brotherly love, and I don't even need to write unto you. He says, you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This is a truth that you already know. And he says, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. You're doing a good job of loving your brethren. You're doing a good job of supporting the people. But he doesn't just say, great, now you just coast on autopilot. He says, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So look, we know that you're loving the brethren. We know that you're good to all Macedonia. Don't stop. In fact, increase more and more. We need to keep pushing. You know what? That's a little uncomfortable. You know, the, the, the good thing about coasting, it's comfortable. You know, I love use, losing, uh, using cruise control. Right? I'm out driving, set the cruise control. You go on a long trip, man. It just makes driving that much easier, right? Well, that's great for driving a car, but in your Christian life, you can't just set it on cruise control and just sit back and relax because you're going to end up finding yourself backsliding. We need to make sure that we're increasing more and more and keep ramping up the speed and, and keep on pushing forward in order to um, <clears throat> keep ourselves from sliding back. Now, think about it this way. Because there's also some dangers in your spiritual life that we ought to be thinking about and conscious of. We want to increase more and more, but the Christian life isn't like isn't a short sprint, right? We think about it in terms of a race. It's it's a it's a marathon. It's a mega marathon. It's an ultra marathon, right? It's 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 a really long endurance um, race that we need to run here, and you want to be careful just not to bite off more than you can chew. Right? You want to be able to, to keep increasing, but keep it reasonable. Right? And I don't want to, I'm not talking about you know, quenching any zeal. Hey, I love when people get zealous and they want to work and serve the Lord, and we should always be encouraging of that. But you have to, to also just be realistic in the sense of um, what you can do and being able to, to make sure that you don't burn yourself out. Right? You could end up doing so much sometimes, I think, where people could get burned out. If you, if you think about it, um, 
in terms of, of working out, exercise, right? If you were to, um, and, and I, <laughs> it's been a while since I've exercised, but the truth, I still know the truth is because I, I remember uh, what it was like way back in the day when, when I would actually work out a little bit more than I do now. But if you, were to, if you were to do too much in any one day, like, you know, like, man, I'm going to get ripped. I'm going to do all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift this much. I'm going to do all these reps. And, and you just push yourself super hard. What happens is you get, like, you get really sore and you're going to be unable to move for an extended period of time. Now, but here's the thing. In order to grow, you can't just be like, have no weights on the bar and just be like, oh, man, I'm going to do a thousand reps of this. And, and, you're, and you, it doesn't, you don't even feel it right? In order to grow, in order to gain more muscle, you need to feel it. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to need to push yourself, but you're going to need to be consistent with it also. If you, do, if you just got, you know, got one exercise in and then you stopped anything forward, you haven't really gained much at all, right? It, you need to keep doing it over and over again. And if you do it too hard, too fast, you just you try to get too zealous all at once, you might end up Man, that really hurt and not going back and continuing uh, doing what you need to do in order to really gain the, uh, the, the good results of getting healthier, getting stronger. You want to plan it out to where, hey, I'm going to start doing this and, and continue to increase though and continue to feel that pain and feel that burn a little bit because once you start just coasting, you end up losing what you've gained to that point. And Consider this as well, you know, when, when, you're, when you're gaining ground, even, you know, even in the spiritual life and in almost any aspect of life, it's all, you always have to work really hard to get in, uh, improvements, to, to continue to get better. And I remember back in, in the days when I was a competitive swimmer, you know, we'd have to work real hard, do tons of practices, tons of workouts and you're just shaving off fractions of seconds or, you know, a really short amount of time, and you have to put in all this effort. But then if you were to, like, take a break for a while, you know, just kind of get out of it and just back off for a year and you, you, don't, you don't put in that effort anymore, you're going to end up losing tons of ground that you had gained by, uh, by taking that break and, and kind of backing off for a while. And then it's going to take a bunch of effort again to get back to the place where you just were Previously, and, and spiritually speaking, it'd be the same thing. It'd take a while to get back because falling back, backsliding is easy. Once you get started on that backslide, it can take you back much farther than, than you'd ever want to go. And then it takes a while to gain back and get back to where the place where you were spiritually speaking as well. Now, uh, turn if you would to Psalm 119. One of the ways that you're going to keep yourself from backsliding is to have the good routines. You know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you're at the point in your life, you say, man, I go soul winning, I read my Bible, I pray, I go to church, you know, I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. I think that's great, and we all should have a routine and have that set in our minds that that is something that we are going to do, that that is something that, that I won't compromise on, I'm just going to keep doing this, I'm going to make it part of my schedule, it's going to be part of my life. Uh, as we, we, we had a discussion earlier today, you know, even just when it comes to, to going to church, because going to church is, is critical for keeping yourself from backsliding, you need to make that decision of where you say, look, I am going to be in church no matter what. Amen. And Pastor Shelley asked a question to me earlier. He said, hey, you know, what is it that, that people can do to make sure you don't get distracted with things so you don't end up backsliding or kind of getting out of serving the Lord? And the number one thing is staying in church. And you make that, but, but the way that you're going to do that, that doesn't just happen by chance. You have to set that priority as something that, that is non-negotiable. It is something that you have to have established in your heart that just says, you know, no matter what happens, I will make sure that I stay going to church to serve the Lord. Now, if you're going to church to serve the Lord, that's the right reason. So no matter what may happen, you can still then continue to go. Because what happens sometimes in people's life, 
They may have that, that, um, that zeal or the desire to serve the Lord and to go to church, but they put too much confidence in one aspect, maybe one church or one man, and then if that man fails or if that church fails, then they end up just getting out of church altogether because they were let down when the real, you know, the whole point of going to church is, is God commands it, and you need to have that established. Hey, even if someone else fails, even if some other man of God fails, no matter what happens, I will continue to go to church because it's right, because it's true, because it's, it's what God has for us to do. Because if I let anything else, any other circumstance, allow me to get out of church, well, guess what? That's when the backsliding starts to happen. And God holds you individually responsible to make sure that you're getting into church and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, and that you're, in, you're in Psalm 119, just stay there. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Bible says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. This is why you need to be in church, by the way, and not just listening to sermons online. Because when you gather together, you're actually considering the other members of the body. It's one whole body. You're like, I don't know what body part the internet is. But it's not really a body part. You need to be gathered together where the Holy Spirit is moving and working. And I'll tell you this much. I've listened to it. Like, I'm not against listening to sermons online. I do it myself. I love listening to other uh, pastors preach and teach the Bible. And, and I learn a lot from listening to other people. And I think it's great. But I'll tell you what, the most serious, impactful sermons and influences I've had in my life personally have been from sitting in church listening to the man of God preach the word of God way more than hearing any other recording that I've ever heard come across the pulpit. It is impactful. It is important. And not only is it the sermon that has that impact, it's everybody else around you. I mean, those people who might follow online, you're not getting the experience of being here and singing the great praises unto the Lord with a bunch of people that love God. Amen. I mean, it is moving. Yeah. Right. We sing these great hymns that are packed full of great doctrine. Amen. We're teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Amen. singing and, and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Among God's people, there is something special to that in itself. There's something edifying in that in yourself that you don't get sitting at home. And that is powerful, and that is going to help you to keep in the Christian fight day after day, week after week, especially when things get difficult. Hey, being around God's people, they care about you. They should. If you're, in, if you're, if you're part of a healthy body, they're going to care about you individually. They're going to care about you and say, hey, what's going on with this other body member? You know, the finger or the toe, as, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, talking about the different members of the body. Hey, what's going on with them? You love that person. You're going to help that person. You see, what can I do for that person? I'm going to pray for that person. You don't get that when you're not in church because you're not part of the body. You need to get plugged in. And then the Bible says in that, in that same passage there in Hebrews 10, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church is critical. Amen. Getting in church is critical. Now, what I, what I want to do this evening, and everything was pretty much uh, by introduction up to this point, is to issue some challenges. And to, by doing this, I'm going to just kind of fill you in it, 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 with what we do at our church, a Stronghold Baptist Church. I have challenges that we issue every single month out of the year, we get one month that I don't have a challenge for. It's like the summer break, okay, where it's, it's choose your own challenge or you do whatever you want to do. But I found this to be very effective um, for myself personally as well as for, for our church because it's, it's important to be focused on the things of God. And, and, and it's a good idea, you know, not to let anything, any one thing slip in your life. Sometimes we get out of balance, right? There's a lot of different things that happen in life. Life gets chaotic. There's, there's plenty of reasons why uh, people might end up having some circumstances that happen that are out of their control, that can cause you to get distracted from the things of God. 
or, or even just various specific things. You know, it could be something as simple as, well, work really ramped up and I've gotten really busy. So the time that I normally would be praying or reading my Bible, I've kind of, I've kind of forsaken that a little bit because of these extra circumstances that just stole my attention for a little bit. And, and that happens. And, I, and we know that things like that will happen. There's going to be emergencies, family emergencies, things that happen that get you out of that routine, right? So it's good to have that routine, but sometimes you can get shaken from that routine. And we need to make sure that we don't just never come back to doing those things that are all critical uh, in, our, in our spiritual life, in our spiritual walk with God. And one of the ways I kind of try to keep tabs on these things is by having these challenges, a different challenge each month, so that if anything was, was kind of slipping or falling by the wayside in my spiritual life, it's a time to focus on those things and be like, no, okay, now I'm going to really spend a lot of time and make sure that I'm not letting, for example, my prayer life slip. I'm going to make sure I'm spending a time in, in staying focused on, on my church attendance and make sure that that's not slipping. I'm going to do everything I can and focus on that and make sure that, that if anything has caused me to not be able to make it into service, that I'm going to make sure that I get into church every time there's a service because it's that important. I mean, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I mean, if you, if, you know, it makes me, it drives me nuts hearing people who want to just put down the importance of going to church Amen. when the scripture is saying it's a pillar and ground of the truth. Right. I mean, how more foundational do you need than the pillar and the ground? Yeah. Right? You've got the ground, and it, like, like that's the supporting structure of the truth. Oh, yeah, but hey, man, we're, you know, we have church in my house where we've got a couple people gathered together and um, we just talk about Jesus. Look, you could have church in a house, but don't get fooled by these house church people that don't have a bishop, they don't have an elder, they don't have someone who's a man of God that's ordained to actually have a church service where you're getting a bunch of believers together to do the thing, you know, to, to worship the Lord and to, and to hear and be edified and do the things that the Bible lays out ought to be done in a church. Don't think just hanging out with your buddies is church. One of the things that we do is we focus on the church attendance. Another thing that we do, and I had you turn to Psalm 119, we do a Bible memory challenge. And, and, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things that you could be doing in your spiritual life, and I, I want you to take stock and just think, hey, is there any area in my life where I should probably be doing more of this? And when you leave this evening, don't just leave thinking, oh, yeah, everything's great. There, we all have areas that we can improve on. Yeah. I mean, I, I continually, look, I, I'll be honest with you, I always have an area that I need to improve on. There's always something that's lacking. And we need to always be focused on making the adjustments that are, that are proper to make sure we're not letting anything slip as much as is possible in our lives. There's a lot that we ought to be doing for the Lord. There's a lot that we ought to be doing for our families. There's a lot that we ought to be doing in our lives. But don't ever just get to the point where you're just thinking like, no, I got it all covered. Because you don't. But, but take the time to reflect and think, what, what should I be doing and, and, and where is it? And, and I'm also going to be giving you, because the Bible, like for almost all of these things, the Bible doesn't tell you specifically, well, how much is it that I need to do? And then I can just be like, that's good enough. And the reason that the Bible doesn't tell us that is because God wants your heart in it. He wants you to have the right attitude and the right heart that just says, hey, if God says this is good for me, I should be doing it, then I just want to do as much as I can. Yeah. Not going, well, what's the minimum that I have to do to not make God angry? Right. right? So the Bible says when it comes to church attendance, hey, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now look, what does that mean? Forsake, right? Is that, is that if I don't go to all three? Now look, I don't think that's, I miss a Wednesday night, I'm going to church twice on Sunday, that you're forsaking it. I don't think that you're forsaking church if you only go once a week. I don't think you're forsaking it, right? 
But there's going to be a point where you're going to say, look, <laughs> when people don't even know if you're a member of the church, like nobody in the church knows when you show up, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I mean, this has been my church for 10 years. <laughs> and you show up, and everyone's like, I'm sorry, who are you? know, <laughs> you, you might have forsaken the church, right? Or like, oh, I thought you moved away. No, I've been here. But that's also why the scripture says so much the more as you see the day approaching, right? The point isn't, well, how little can I go to not forsake? It's, no, you need this more and more and more. You need that provoking. You need that edification. You need that encouragement more and more. So where you have the mindset of going, hey, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to make it to church every time there's a service, as much as possible. When it comes to Bible memory, for example, you know, there's reading the Bible. And look, reading the Bible just by itself, again, the Bible doesn't say how often you need to do it. But the Bible does say, Jesus said this when he answered Satan, when Satan was trying to tempt him into turning the, the stone into bread. He referenced uh, the Old Testament. He said, you know, Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Right? So, so the word of God is important and you say, well, how often do I need to read my, how many chapters, how many verses, how, you know, what is it that I need to do to be right with God? Well, I'll tell you this much. If Jesus is, is relating the word of God and consuming the word of God to bread, I mean, how much do you need to eat? Well, you need to eat enough to survive, right? But do you think that God's going to be like, okay, just eat, you know, if you ate once every three days, you'll survive. Like you'll, you'll continue to exist as a human being, well, that's not really thriving, right? I mean, you want to think about this. Well, in Matthew 6, you know, the, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. So, I mean, you're, you, if, you're, if you're eating bread every day and he's likening the Word of God to eating bread and say, look, it's more than just eating bread, I would think it, it, reason would stand that we should be reading our Bible at least every day then. Yeah. If we're going to be eating bread every day, we ought to be getting the Word of God every day. And these are standards that we ought to have in our life. And I, I think that, you know, you're going to do yourself a disservice if you don't set up these standards in your life. Spiritually speaking, if you just, if you just start to let these things slip, you let them go away. And look, we also need to make sure why we put these standards in effect to begin with, right? Like I, I raise my children, they have rules that they have to follow, but I don't want them just to follow the rules because they're the rules. I want them to understand the rules. And when I preach on this stuff, I also don't want anyone thinking like, well, that's what Pastor Burson said, so that's just what we should do to the spiritual life. Well, no, let's, let's understand why that is. So we don't just have rules for the sake of having rules. We have the rules so we can look at why is that there? Why do we have these standards? Well, it's because of what the Word of God says and the importance that the Bible places on these things. And again, we could look at, well, how much should we be reading of the Word of God as much as we can? consume as much of the Word of God as you can, and we're going to find that answer is going to be coming up a lot with all these different things. Well, yeah, you're going to have a little bit of a conflict, which is also why I want to make sure we don't get too out of balance with all the various things that God wants us to do to where we just leave some things by the wayside and just focus only on one thing. We need all of these things in our Christian life to make sure that we're the, the growing properly as a child of God. So I had you turn to Psalm 119, and, and you know, one of the challenges that we do in our church is in the month of January, read the entire New Testament. I understand that you all do that here at Verity Baptist Church as well, uh, where you have that, that challenge of going, hey, let's, let's try to make sure we read through all of the New Testament. And if you do about nine chapters a day, then you can, you can easily do that task. And what I love about these challenges is that it forces you to look at your schedule and say, how can I make this happen? And say, hey, well, this is important. This is something I want to make sure I do. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm getting through this much Bible every month or every year or every day. How am I going to make this happen? You need to start making other sacrifices maybe in, what, in, in, in your life. Yeah. So reading the, reading the whole New Testament, that's one of the challenges that we do. Uh, another challenge that we do is a Bible memory challenge. Look at Psalm 119, verse number 9. 
You say, well, I read my Bible, isn't that enough? Well, the Bible talks a lot about meditating on the Word of God also and, and keeping the Word of God in your heart. Verse number 9, the Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to my word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, warning against backsliding. Well, what's backsliding entail? Getting into sin. Right? Being, just doing sinful things. Well, you want to make sure and try to prevent yourself from getting into sin. Well, you know what a great way of doing that is? Hiding God's word in your heart. Amen. It's going to be a lot harder for you to give in to that flesh when you've been feeding the spirit with the word of God so much that it's in your heart. So much when, you know, when, when, when you say, you know what, I'm not, you know, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And when you have that just committed to memory, you have a problem with alcohol, well, the Holy Ghost is going to bring up that passage to your remembrance because you've already hit it in your heart. It's going to help you to avoid that temptation and that snare of, of going down that wrong path of getting involved with booze, right? Even just, well, it's just one beer. Keep the Word of God committed in your heart. That's why he says, hey, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, jump down to verse number 97. Verse number 97, the Bible reads, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You know what's going to really help you in this life and make you really wise? The Word of God. I don't know about you, but I hate making stupid decisions. I've made enough of them in my life. I don't want to make any more. Well, you know what? When you get the Word of God in your heart and you let the, the, the Word of God guide you and instruct you to light your path before you and you use the wisdom in the Word of God and you have that hid in your heart, you have that, that ready to go. So when any situation comes across you where you're just like, wow, I don't think the Bible talks about this. you got enough Bible in your heart. It's going to guide you down the right path and make the application. One, because if you just, just by even committing to memory, you're meditating on that word. You're thinking about that, that verse probably more than you ever have just by reading. And I see a lot of the heads nodding. And you know what? Those are the people who've, who've memorized verses because you know what I'm saying is true. When you commit the word of God to memory, you are forced to think about it a lot more because you're going to be reciting that passage over and over and over again in your mind and just, and just trying to remember that. So how am I going to remember this? You got to, it's very repetitive. But as you do that process of memorization, you're thinking about things and, and God's going to open up truths that you hadn't seen before just by virtue of you spending so much time thinking about it, yeah. meditating on it. And that's a fact. And if you haven't done it before, you say, well, I don't, I'm not really good at, at, me, at memorizing things in general. I'm not, I'm not very good at it. Well, I mean, don't you want to not sin against the Lord? Don't you want to have more understanding than all my teachers? Don't you want to have that wisdom? I mean, I do. And, and that's not a spiritual gift. By the way, memorization is not a spiritual gift. Some people may have to work at it a little bit harder than others. I get that. But everybody can memorize things. You all learn. That, I mean, you all probably know a password, right, to get into your account. Everyone, everyone has some things memorized. The Word of God is no different. It's just, are you investing the time in it? Do you care enough about it? Is it that important to you? Oh, here's a really good, I, I love this challenge. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn to Romans chapter 8. We do, we do two different challenges, but they're both, they're both tied together. One of them that we do at our church for one month is you've got you've to dedicate one hour of your day 
to anything that would be spiritual or a godly activity, you know, that could be soul winning, praying, reading your Bible, you know, you're making sure you're spending and giving God your first fruits and making sure that you're dedicating and, you know, partitioning off at least a section of your life to where every single day I am going to spend time with the Lord one way or another. And again, that will force you, and that could be Bible, you know, any of the things that you know are the will of God, things that God would have you to do, you're, you're dedicating one hour of your time and just making sure. Now, look, I don't think one hour is much of a challenge, per personally. I think we should have more than one hour of our time spent doing things that are of God. But, you know, I'm trying to get as many people involved as possible. And, you know, uh, wherever you're at, we can always do more. We well, should always be trying to increase more and more. Another challenge that we have is we just did this for the first time where I, I specified what it was. It used to be a challenge where it was identify one thing in your life that is just kind of a waste of time and just stop doing that for the month. Right? Just, just find one thing that's just, it, it adds no value. And just stop doing that. Because you know what it's going to do? It's going to free up your time. Because the Bible says that we ought to redeem the time because the days are evil. We need, to, we need to make the best use of our time as possible. This year, I changed the challenge just a little bit to be the digital detox. Because what, what I find is that the, the, <laughs> the most common way that people waste their time is right here. I'm not against technology, okay? I, I'm in IT, like, <laughs> in my secular job. I, I think there's great tools and great resources. I love being able to learn and use technology to my advantage. But let's face it, it is a huge time waster for a tremendous number of people in this world. And, and I see the, the ramification of the impact of it. I, I see what's happening to our society and to our culture and to our children especially with how much time they're putting their face in front of a screen. Yeah. And look, it's dangerous. Yeah. When, you just, when you just have yourself just kind of unfettered access or you just start spending so much time on this, people lose interpersonal relations. Now look, the Word of God, our mission here, as ministers of the Word of God, people are the most important thing. We need to be focused on building relationships with people, on serving people, on loving your brother, on doing these things. But you know what I see? Interpersonal relationships going down the toilet. I see entire families going out to eat and sitting down, and everybody's got a stupid phone in their face. So instead of enjoying time together with your children, your mom, your dad, brother, sister, everybody's just looking at a device and just seeing what everybody else is doing or playing some game, wasting your time. I think it's ridiculous. I, I, it makes me angry to see people. It's disrespectful. It's rude. When you're gathered around fellowshipping with people and then someone's just off on their phone... Like, what are you doing? Seriously, I mean, this is a big problem. And in Romans 8, I had you turn to Romans 8, look at verse number 15, the Bible says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know how not to have an addiction in your life. Now, Commonly, we refer to addictions like smoking, drinking, right? Pornography, those are all really bad things. And look, if, if you have that addiction, get rid of those things out of your life. You ought not to be in that bondage. But I think the, the addiction that probably affects the most number of people is the digital addiction. This is why I call our challenge that we do in our church a digital detox. Test yourself. Are you able to put the device down for any amount of time, I mean, even just one day. If you can't put your phone down for a day without just having to pick it up and, oh, I just got to check it, you got a problem. You got a problem. 
And we do it for a month. <laughs> we do it for a month. Now, it doesn't mean you can't use the tool for something that's legitimate, but, but if you're just wasting your time scrolling through social media, you know, just doing stuff that's just completely not necessary, yeah, that's, we're trying to make sure that we don't just get sucked into these things because it's so easy. It's so easy to do. But I'll tell you what, that, that ends up just being a huge waste of time. Redeem the time because the days are evil. That's one of my favorite challenges. In fact, you know what, though? This works. I've had church members come up to me and say, you know what, Pastor Burzins, since, you, uh, since, since we did that challenge, and people get excited about the challenges, I hope you get excited about challenges and, and, and saying, you know what, I want to improve my spiritual life, and I think I might have a problem here. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to do it. I've had people say, you know what, we canceled our subscriptions to these you know, streaming media or whatever because we got rid of it for a month and we just realized we don't need this in our life. Our life's busy enough as it is. I don't need to be wasting my time just looking at the world's garbage anyways. Just get rid of it. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. How much time do I need to redeem? All of it. <laughs> redeem your time. Make the best use of it as you can. And look, I'm not against entertainment in and of itself. But it, you, know, you really ought to have that in check and, and under control. Right? We do, a, we do another challenge, a prayer challenge. And I think this is also another area where a lot of Christians uh, are, are lacking in. It's, and and it, it's funny because prayer is not hard, but it ends up being very hard for many people. Why? Because you have to carve out the time to do it. We often, and, and, and I'll, I'll include myself as guilty in this, can end up just kind of speeding through prayers. You know you need to pray, you want to pray, but you don't really end up taking the time that you ought to be to, to, to really be praying and caring for the people as you should, as other, other members of your church, or even for needs that you have yourself. You know, we, we need to go to God with, with, with all of our troubles and our cares. You know, Jesus said, you know, you, you have, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. I mean, what, what, a great, what a great promise from God. Hey, just ask, and you'll receive. And how many people just don't ask? The word pray means to ask, but you just, you just don't do it. God's saying, hey, just ask. Ask me what you want. We should be taking advantage of that, because God's a God that answers prayer. And nothing is too hard for the Lord. So when we go to the Bible, though, we think, like, well, what, what's a reasonable amount of time? How much time as a Christian should I be spending in prayer? What, what really would be a good number? I mean, I, I want to pray more. What, what, what should I be thinking about? What should I be using as a good standard for my time in prayer? Well, look at, look at Acts chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Well, you know, there's one example where there was an hour set aside for prayer. The hour of prayer that was at the ninth hour. And people gather together and pray at the ninth hour regularly, consistently. You know, there's plenty. And look, I, I'm going through so many different subjects. You know, entire sermons can be preached on all of these things. Look them up for yourself and, and start looking at the Bible. How much time should I be spending here? Well, in Luke 6, 12, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. That's what Jesus Christ did. More than once, he would go out and pray all night. So here we have Jesus. During the day, he's out healing, preaching, ministering to people. And then he separates himself from the group for a while and, and carves out time he said, look, my day was busy today, God. I don't have time to pray. Well, you know what he did? He's like, well, no, I'm making time to pray. Yeah, I had a busy day, and I was serving the Lord, but we're not going to stop. You know, I mean, he was doing everything he was supposed to do. 
I mean, think about that. How many times do you waste your time or spend time on other things that aren't even godly? You just be like, well, I was too busy today, so tomorrow I'll just worry about reading my Bible or praying and doing these things. It's bad enough having that attitude. Jesus was doing all the right things where you might be able to say, hey, look, I, I spent my day serving the Lord. I'm just going to take a break now. He's like, no, I'm going to go now and I'm going to pray because I didn't get a chance to pray as I should. And he ends up spending all night in prayer. Now, I'm not saying on a continual basis you need to spend every night in prayer. <laughs> You're going to run into some problems if you do that. But we see the importance of spending a significant amount of time in prayer. And when you study the Bible, you'll see when people have, when there's serious things coming up, when Jesus was going to select his disciples, he spent a lot of time, you know, in prayer. Big decisions you're going to make. People will fast and pray and do things. Look, don't, don't let that slip by. Don't, you know, don't be negligent. If you've got some important decision coming up in your life, some big, you know, some big thing, some big tragedy, some big event, whatever it is, carve out the time to pray. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Night and day, praying exceedingly to see other people. We see the disciples, we see the apostles, we see the apostle Paul making that statement here saying that he's been praying night and day. We even Daniel, right? Now, you could say, well, I pray at night before I go to bed. Great. I pray in the morning when I get up. Amen. Amen. That's good. And, and whatever your schedule is, don't stop. Well, I'm saying we should increase more and more. <laughs> Daniel had a habit of praying three times a day, clearly laid out in scriptures. And even when they passed a law saying you can't pray unless you go and ask permission first from the, from the king, you know what he did? He still kept praying. Just as it was, his, you know, I'm going to pray three times a day. And look, I think that's a great standard to have. I'm going to make sure I'm praying three times a day. I'm going to pray in the morning when I wake up. I'm going to pray at some point in the middle of the day while I'm, while I'm uh, um, doing my work, doing my business, whatever it is. And then in the evening again, I'm going to pray again. You know what that helps you do? It helps you keep God at the forefront of your mind. Making sure you're communicating to your heavenly father. You know what's going to help you do? Not backslide. You know what's going to help you do? Stay spiritually minded. It's going to help you not get distracted with the cares of this world when you continually have a part of your day Every day, three times a day, I'm going to spend time praying to the Lord. It's another challenge. We have another challenge with, with getting people baptized and focusing on that. And this is something that, that, again, can fall by the wayside. You know, we go out soul winning, and sometimes you remember to bring up stuff. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you'll talk to people about the King James Bible. Sometimes you'll talk to them about going to church. You know, these are all important things after you lead someone to Christ. But you know what's really important is, is people getting baptized. It's a command. You know, we are Baptists, by the way. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be laying off on the baptisms. We need more people getting baptized. And, and, you know, I can't even fully explain it, but there's definitely a power to people getting baptized. I got saved when I was 20 years old. But I didn't really start getting on fire and serving the Lord until after I got baptized. And that didn't happen until I got plugged into a really good church. You get the good church, you get baptized, and you know what? And, and we ought to be getting people baptized. I, I, there's some that, that, obviously you can't change history. I don't know exactly what would have happened. But if I, if I would have gotten baptized a lot earlier, I would guess I'd be more likely to be living for God much earlier in my life by taking that first step of obedience and, and um, dying to, to old self and, and walking in newness of life. But the Bible says, that, you know, of course, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I mean, this is, this is part of the Great Commission, getting people baptized. Bring it up to people. Hey, if you're here tonight... 
and you haven't been baptized since you got saved, you haven't been dunked under the water, not just sprinkled, but haven't been biblically baptized, get baptized tonight. Yeah. The good news is you only have to do it one time, and then you're, you're set. Just get it out of the way. Get it done. Make sure that that's settled for you. And look, if you've already been baptized, encourage other people to get baptized. And not even necessarily just the people that you win to Christ. Sometimes you run into people who are already saved. Why don't you think about asking them, hey, have you been baptized? I know you've got a church. I know you're saved. Hey, praise the Lord. But have you been baptized? And look, even if they don't come to this church and get baptized, if they say, you know what? No, I haven't been baptized. I'm going to get baptized tomorrow at my local church. Great. That's a win for the, for the kingdom of God. And I love this, this um, I just heard this recently from Brother Segura from Faith Ward Baptist Church. It's a method, I haven't put this into practice yet, but I love it, and I'm going to start using this. Sometimes it's hard to, to, to change your own routines, right? But if you think about them and you care about them, you can, you can do these things. And he has this method of, of convincing people to get baptized, because sometimes people have all kinds of different reasons why they don't want to get baptized, Right? I mean, whatever it is. Whether it, it could go on and on and on, on on all the different reasons why someone might not want to get baptized. But if someone's saved, you care about the things of God, you just ask them this question, you know, hey, well, what do you think about baptism? You think it's a good thing to get baptized? Do you think it's good? Yeah. I mean, who's, who's going to say, who's going to be a saved person that says, no, it's not good? <laughs> right? Of course they're going to say, yeah, it's good, right? The Bible says we should get baptized. You show Matthew 28, right? Jesus said, hey, we should get baptized. You say, okay, well, it's a good thing, right? Well, you know, the Bible says in James 4, 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Huh. <laughs> well, what do you think about getting baptized at church on Sunday? I think that's great. Because you know what that should do? It should highlight baptism is important. Look, if it's something good, we ought to be doing it. Amen. And when you don't do things that are good, that is sin. Yeah. Don't lose sight of that. And, and it's important to understand that. And it's the truth. It's the truth. Let the Word of God convict people. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. So I already covered our church attendance. We have a church attendance challenge. I think that's super easy. It's just show up to church every time we have a church service. And for those people who, who come to our church that don't live really close and they might not be able to make it, I say go to a, another local church in your area. It may not be your favorite one, but just find a church that's got the right gospel. Right? Find a church that you could still consider like is a church in God's eyes and just go there for the midweek service. And you know what? I think some of those people... Now, when they can't make it to our church, have a church to go to. Amen. It's not just about our church. It's about people getting among the believers and serving the Lord. I don't care if you do it at our church or another church. Just, just serve God. Amen. I mean, yeah, you should go to the best church that you can, but get in church. We have another challenge where we try to encourage people to bring visitors, Right? You say, why is that important? Where is that in the Bible? Well, how about making disciples of people? Lead someone to Christ. Get them plugged into church. That's how they're going to grow. That's how they're really going to start serving the Lord. Actively participate in being part of that great commission and bring people into church and be thinking about that. Hebrews 13, we have another challenge. It's a singing challenge. One of my church members actually suggested this to me, and I thought it was an awesome idea. I love it. Singing challenge. Singing is important. And look, I'm preaching, in a sense, to the choir here. This is some of the best singing that I've heard of, of any church that I've been to. It's awesome. It's great. But it is an integral part of church. And I was just preaching on this in my church last week because, you know, there's some people, and look, this is a great, there's great singing here, but there's, I guarantee there's probably at least one person who doesn't really sing during the singing that's in the congregation tonight. You know I know that because I, I used to be that person. I'd get my songbook, time to sing, 
I turn to the song. <laughs> Maybe I'd move my lips, right? And not sing. Or if I did sing, it would be like under my breath. It's like no one could hear it. Look, usually the reason why people don't sing is because you're focused on the wrong thing again. You're thinking about yourself. You're worried about what other people might think. You're worried about hurting someone else's ears. Right? Maybe that's the case. I don't know. But we don't sing for ourselves. We don't sing even for other people to think how great of a singer we are. We sing because we're praising the Lord. So the Lord's good. His mercy endureth forever. Okay, God is great. God is worthy of our praise. And when you think about it that way, when you think about, hey, I'm going to refrain from praising God in the midst of the congregation. I'm going to stop doing it. What does that say to God? Who do you really care about? You care about embarrassing yourself? How about you just care about the Lord enough to love him and just give him the praise? Hebrews 13, verse number 15, the Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You want to offer up a sacrifice to God? How about you offer up the sacrifice of your lips, the sacrifice of praise to our Savior who is way more than worthy of your praise. It's what we ought to be doing. Christians ought to be praising God every day, but especially in the house of God. Soul winning. This is, this is a challenge. We have multiple soul winning challenges because of the importance. We have a challenge where, we're, where the challenge is to go out and try to attempt to give the gospel to at least one person every single day of the month. We have another challenge where you'd have to add at least one hour to your regular soul winning that you do every week. Why? To get focused on doing more. Try to push yourself. Make it uncomfortable. You know, the Red Hop Region Conference... I don't know how you're feeling right now, but hopefully something that's been mentioned tonight is making you a little bit uncomfortable. Saying, I don't think I'm doing that great of a job in this area. I think I could do more. I think I need to do more. Hey, that's what it's all about. That's what hot preaching is all about. You hear and you see the areas. You look in that glass using the Word of God to see yourself, to see your own, your own life, and say, you know what? I need to make a change. I need to do more. I think I've gotten a little too comfortable. I think I've let this area of my life go by the wayside. You say, no, I'm going to change that. Now, don't be the forgetful hearer. Go out from this conference with all the excitement, with all the zeal, and incorporate that change. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. The Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Look, if you're born again, you're saved. You're a new creature. You've got that new man. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. You know what part of that is? All things are of God. He's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he's given to us that ministry of reconciliation. This is every believer. This is everybody who's a new creature. This isn't just for the pastor. This isn't just for the deacon. This isn't just for anyone that you can think of that's not you. Right? Everyone else, but not me. No. Are you a new creature in Christ? Well, guess what? This is for you, too. Have you been reconciled with God? Well, now that ministry of reconciliation is committed unto you. Verse 19, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Jesus Christ isn't walking around this earth anymore, you know, 
preaching the gospel to people. He said, but you know what? We are. So in Christ's stead, we are representing Jesus Christ. We're his ambassador to go forth and tell people, hey, you need to be reconciled to God. You've got a problem because of your sin. You've got a, a debt that you owe, a hell payment that you need to make. But you know what? Someone made that payment for you. You can be reconciled from that problem you have. You know, you've been, God is, is angry with you. The wrath of God is abiding on you. But you can be reconciled. It can all be made okay right now if you put your trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he made that sin payment for you when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. That's your job. Look, someone did that for you. You ought to do that for other people. The Bible says that you know, the Lord's given ministers by whom we believe. He's given that for every man. Because the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. God's given you know, the, the command to go forth. God has a plan for everybody, for every new creature, for every child of God to go forth and reconcile people to Christ. That is our job. And we definitely want to make sure we're not letting that fall by the wayside. That's why we as a church do, do two challenges like that a, a year. I mean, we have, we have regular soul winning times, of course. We've got all this stuff, but you know what? We ought to try to push ourselves a little bit more. What more can I do? Let's try to increase more and more. And, and as you focus on these various aspects of your life, you know, I want, to, I want to make it as a pastor of my church so people don't have free time because <laughs> you're serving God. You know what that does? You, it helps people not to get involved in sin because when you have a whole bunch of free time, just like, I don't know, I got all this time. You know, I've got tons of time. I can just do whatever I want and you don't have a plan for that time, you're going to find yourself doing something sinful. Because if you don't already have the plan, if you don't already have a focus, you've got this flesh that's going to give you all kinds of ideas of what you could do with your time. We have the will of God. We know what it is. It's right here. Nothing in your life should be by accident or just be like, well, I don't know. Look, have a plan. Set up this. I'm, 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 a, I'm a big proponent of the routine, of the schedule. Put it in. You know, I, I have certain standards or, I'm, you know, it's a very base minimum. Like, no matter what, the Bible's going to get read at least one time this year. Like, I mean, that is bare bones. I think that's bare bones minimum. That is so low on the, you know, on, on the objective. Look, I, now, I want to do a lot more. I do do more than that. But I'm saying, like, like there's, a, there's a level where it's just like, I will not fall below this standard. Just not going to happen. And, and, you know, soul winning, same thing. Praying, same thing. All these various aspects, we ought to have at least a, a you know, severe alert, red alert, warning level of going, I'm not going to go below this. But not just that. Hey, but, you know, the focus is what more can I do? Amen. I don't ever want to have to get to that point of just being like, hey, things have gotten out of control. But you know, sometimes they do. Crazy things happen in life. But you just want to make sure, hey, I'm, I'm never going to forget these things. So then we could get right back quickly to going, all right, now I'm going to, you know, things have gotten a little bit more settled down in this area of my life. I'm, I'm going to focus more about serving the Lord again. It takes a lot of work in this life. It's work. It's laborers. That's why Jesus said in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 9, as well as in, in other places, Matthew 9, 35, the Bible says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said the end of his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We need more workers. We need more people that are going to say, yeah, I'm going to do it. And again, you know, praise the Lord for those you know, 250 some people yesterday that showed up for soul winning. That's amazing. That's great. Praise God. That's good. We ought to be happy with that. It's great. But you know what? There needs more. How many million people are in the Sacramento area? Anyone know? I don't know. 
Two? Two million? It's a lot of people. 250 people, it's going to take a long time to reach two million people. We need more laborers. Because you know what? There's not that many people out there doing it. We need people to make the commitment and say, you know what? No, this is important. No, I'm not going to let myself back. I know I'm not going to get caught up with the cares of this world. I'm going to make sure I'm plugged into church. I'm going to make sure I'm praying. I'm going to make sure I'm reading my Bible. I'm going to make sure I'm going out there, even when it's over 100 degrees outside, and preaching the gospel to people. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's the last place we're going to turn tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I appreciate you all hanging with me. I know it's hot, and you're probably exhausted from all the work that you've done, but hang with me. It's the last passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 58. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's lots of ways you'd be spending your time. There's lots of work you could be doing that at the end of the day is going to end up kind of being vain. There's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble that you could dedicate your life to that's going to account for nothing in the kingdom of God. But when you, when you work for the Lord, when you work for the spiritual things that God said for you, you know what? That's not in vain. That's not in vain. That's something that you can take with you. Those treasures, those eternal rewards that you get in heaven, hey, they're laid up. Praise the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now look, you've been receiving a lot from the Word of God over the past few days. There's been a lot of different sermons preached about various things. And, and I, would, I could probably safely say, I could speak for all the pastors in this regard, that... The people who are preaching to you are preaching these things because we love you. Because we want to help you. Not because we're coming from this position of like, oh, I, I, I'm perfect and you're not. and I'm No, look, we're helping each other too. That's right. And all the things that I preach, like I struggle with the same things you do. I've got the flesh as much as you do, but I've made some decision in my life and these are important. I'm going to place these as a high priority and I want you to do the same thing. Amen. And these things work. And when you hear the word of God from people that love you, just as the Apostle Paul did, we read his heart to, to, to the Thessalonians in chapter number 2, receive the words and don't just let it pass you by. It's the last sermon of the conference. Don't leave here without something. Something you're going to take with you. Something you're going to change. Something that you will be impacted by as you move forward. Because there's been a lot of effort from the people who've been standing behind these pul this pulpit to help you in, in what, all these, or whatever area you needed help with. And I don't know what that is, but I know that, that I've done a, a lot of praying in advance of this conference for God to help. Hey, whatever it is, Lord, please help me to help as many people as possible that are going to hear the sermon that's going to be preached. Whatever that may be. And, that's, and, and for all the past, for all the preach, for all the sermons. God knows. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, so, that, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. The sermons preached at the conference, while you may not always think so if you've got this creepy head in the hand, are still preached out of love, okay? And, and I know these men very personally, look, you're dear unto us. And, and, and as much as possible, I'd like to impart my own soul. Whatever could be helpful, whatever is going to help you to succeed, I'll get props if that's what's needed, right? I'll change what I could change to help you. Verse number nine, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable in any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. You're witnesses and God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged 
Every one of you as a father doth his children. The, you know, as you hear the word of God preached, if you've got someone that's preaching and is trying to exhort you and comfort you and give you charges and say, look, receive that. Don't, don't close your ear to the word of God. Receive it. That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. We're called unto God's kingdom and glory. Let's try to walk worthily. Verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. There's definitely nothing special about me as a person or the words that I say, but you know what? There is something special about the word of God. So the things that I've taught today that are from the Word of God, receive those things. Amen. Why? Because they are effectual in working in you that believe. Receive it. Think on these things. I'm trying to call to your attention some area where you might be lacking. Receive it. Make the change. Increase more and more. <laughs> things have been increasing here, and it's awesome. Keep increasing. Don't back down. Don't let it slide. Don't back off a little bit. Yeah, it may be hard. Yeah, it requires a lot of work. Yeah, you might need to labor day and night to help other people. But you know what? That's what the life's all about. That's what the Christian life is all about. That's what Jesus Christ was about. He esteemed others better than himself. Let's follow his example. Let's bow our have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for all the encouragement that we receive, for all the the, the highlights of the areas of our life that we need to work on and improve, dear Lord, I pray that you please help us. Give us the strength that we need so we can increase more and more. Lord, I pray that you would please help us uh, to avoid uh, backsliding and, and that we would all be open to, to identifying the areas of our life that need work, dear Lord, and I pray that you please help us with that. Lord, uh, thank you so much for bringing everyone here together, and uh, it, it truly has been an honor to be here among your people. And, and to serve you and to preach your word. I pray that you please keep everybody safe uh, as, as we travel, especially those of us have, that have traveled from out of town. Lord, watch over us, protect us, keep us safe from evil. And uh, Lord, please bless Verity Baptist Church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.